everybody, and welcome back to the General Eclectic Podcast with Rod Dreer. I'm your host, Kale Zeldin, and we're here for episode number 12. And uh, we're going to just jump right into it because there's so much going on as usual. And I'm sure if you follow Rod at his um, blog at the American Conservative, you know that there's always something going on out there. And really the thing that has hit uh, like a storm, really, even since our last show, Rod, is this business of of the woke military. Earlier, you know, our listeners and viewers may re- be may, be, may recall that we were talking about sort of Tucker Carlson, you know, being piled on by some some pretty high ups in the military. But the military just keep just can't get out of the news here. So what, no. what, what what's going on in your blog? You just just put this out just a few minutes ago. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got an email today from uh, an army reservist. He's a judge advocate, an army lawyer yeah. who is basically facing the ruin of his military career because on January 6th or January 7th, he posted something on Facebook. I had a picture of one of those loons who went into the Capitol, guy carrying a Confederate flag. Yeah, and I remember that picture. I yeah, the yeah, picture the famous picture. Well, the, the guy who wrote me, and I, I chose not to use his name at his request, yep. he uh, put something on Facebook. He sent me the thing, the thing he put on Facebook, uh, say, saying that, oh, look what the Army of Northern Virginia couldn't do, this loon did in one day, something to that effect, and with yeah. a smiley face on there. A like, tasteless like, joke. Like, like an emoji type thing? Right, an emoji. The, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so a tasteless joke in retrospect. But mm-hmm. um, because of this, this guy has just gotten, um, I forget what they call it, it's an official reprimand from from the hot, from the Pentagon itself coming down hard on him. And basically his military career is over. And, and he said later, he said, look, you know, if you know, he told me in this email that I, I posted to my blog that, uh, you know, I, I maybe should have you had gotten my wrist slapped. I would have said, yeah, it was imprudent. Yeah. But, you know, I was yeah. clearly joking, but they're not taking any, they, they're, they're just serious as a heart attack here. What this man thinks is that this is part of, the, the new woke military's purge of anybody on the right, political or, or cultural. Uh, what's interesting about this, Kale, is uh, this past weekend I was in Northern Virginia, right. and uh, I talked to a man, a soldier, who's posted to the Pentagon, and he was talking about the new wokeness in the military, and he he said that uh, he didn't sign up for this. He said I, yeah. I I can't. He said you can't imagine how quickly it's all coming down just since Biden got in. Mm-hmm. And uh, he told me that he would not want his son to serve in the military, which is just astonishing. And I mean, well, especially to this- hear that, especially to hear that from 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 conservatives. I mean, that, oh, that's, sure. that's a yeah. real sea change. I mean, it's certainly a sea change in our entire lives. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I uh, and I heard something today from another reservist who said same thing. And he, he told me something that I, I couldn't use on the blog because it's it's too sensitive. But. Basically, he, he said that they've been told and where he is that, you know, if, if you're a white male, you're not going to get promoted because we want diversity promotion within the military. Mm-hmm. The guy said, I don't care what color people are, what yeah. their sexual uh, desires are. I don't care about any of that. I care about them being competent because we're a military fighting force. You know, the guy I talked to in, in, uh, in Virginia told me, he said that it's just killing him because he said the Chinese are focused on building the strongest military they can to win wars. We, on the other hand, are now using our military for social engineering. I said to the guy, well, so what's it going to take to turn this around? He looked at me and said, I think losing a major war. I think that's the only thing that'll do it because this is so thoroughly saturating the upper ranks of our military. I mean, I mean, honestly, you know, you say that out loud and it's so chilling to me to, to think that we have kind of gotten to this point, you know, if all of these stories pan out and it sounds like there's, there's, there's some real um, validity to it. One of the things that struck me about the story you posted today about the gentleman who got, is it Mopar or something like this? I think something whatever, like that, I, uh, basically unpersoned uh, from a, from a uncareered, I think, you know, from a military standpoint was the, that the senior officer, uh, he asked to talk to the senior officer, the senior officer breaks protocol and says, no, you're getting in my car because apparently if you're an upper uh, a, a rank above whoever you're talking to, you drive, not him. Mm-hmm. Anyway, breaks that protocol and asks him if he has his phone on him. And the guy says, yeah, my phone's right here, but it's turned off. He's like, no, no, sit on your phone. And he's like, what do you mean sit on your phone? You can listen to the thing even when it's turned off. 
<laughs> yeah, that yeah, really I, wasn't the point of your your post earlier. But there it again. is, right? But there it is. I'm like, whoa, that's the kind of stuff that that we we have speculated about. I think you and I have talked a little mm-hmm. bit about it. You certainly have blogged about the um the the the, the power um that these devices that we have invited into our lives um have. But to have in, in this sort of hot situation to have a, 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 an upper up, you know, muckety muck, um basically confirm you know those things that we've been talking about yeah. that was that that was additionally chilling yeah well um, the man said the the, the, the uh, judge advocate who write, wrote to me said mm-hmm. you know my colonel told me they've been listening to your phone i mean you know this is the stuff i i, I don't know if you were a fan of 24 back in the day what was it about nah, a decade nah. ago maybe maybe a decade and a half ago is jack bauer and 24 and it was a great tv show but one of the things that they could always do is they could use cell phones and and um uh cameras you know traffic cameras and all these sort of things and they could sort of patch through and i remember at the time thinking like man that'd be kind of cool if they could really do it well apparently you can do it and i haven't haven't i been naive you know well well, like the uh the the guy who wrote to me said in a letter and again you can read this on my blog at the american conservative Mm -hmm. you know he, he said that they He's trying to think about what he might have said, but he said he realizes that in a totalitarian regime, it doesn't matter what you say. They'll find whatever they need to. Yeah, I love I thought I I don't love that, obviously, audience. I don't love that. But I but I I latched onto that same detail that that, you know, and and I've sort of said similar type things, you know, when I when I start contemplating, you know, the surveillance state and the soft totalitarianism that you've been talking about, the social credit system that you've been talking about, um, especially uh, not just in your blog, but 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 naturally in Live Not By Lies, which is doing very well, by the way, audience, you should, uh, if you haven't gotten it, you should go get it. We'll talk a little <laughs> bit about that later. But um, I can shill for you, Rod, it's easier, right? Yeah, now. right so, but, but um, is is that that it doesn't matter? I remember saying like when say, oh well, Google can look through all your emails and they cache all of your emails. And I remember sort of saying, I was like, well, that doesn't matter. I'm not really doing anything wrong. <laughs> and um, I, yeah, I think it was you who said, yeah, Kale, that's that's pretty naive. I think you said something to the effect of, it doesn't matter that you haven't done anything wrong. It's that have you done anything or said anything or written anything or received anything that later on can be sort of yeah. backwards uh uh used backwards as a kind engineered of, yeah yeah reverse engineering well, uh, uh uh guilt well yeah that's what uh camilla bendova uh the the dissident in prague told me that about the naivete of americans mm-hmm. and of uh, westerners yeah. and even of people in her own country mm-hmm. uh, who are young and who didn't live under communism she said yeah. that nobody's innocent so if they want to get you they right. ha- they will Pick something you said that they have on, they've recorded, and they'll manufacture it in a way to make you sound guilty. And uh, I mean, it's just when you hear this old lady saying this, you're like, this sounds like the, this, the most paranoid stuff. Then you realize yeah. she lived through it. She saw right. this happen to people in her yeah. own circles. Yeah, it, it's experiential. And I think that that mm-hmm. is, you know, those of us who have um, had the blessings of liberty, right, and have lived in this great country um, and have, you know, our, all of our default um, assumptions uh, for most of us and, you know, some of us who, you know, used to be normies and maybe not so much <laughs> normies now, um, you know, we're just not accustomed to thinking about it in those terms. And so I know even even now, even all that I've read, even all the conversations that you and I have talked about with soft totalitarianism and, and all of it, I still have to kind of check myself um, because my first inclination is to say, all right, Kale, why don't you go, you know, to the to the drawer over drawer over there and fashion your tin foil your tin foil cap, <laughs> and, you know, right? I mean, and I'm I'm sort of sneering at myself, and then I start to say, well, wait a second, you know, this stuff actually does no, happen. No, it's ha- it has it's happened, happened. Now. and it's happening. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that and that is one of the things that really strikes me, and I think this is probably connected to why Live Not by Lies, even five months after publication, is still doing really, really well. Is that more and more people are being, I guess, what you could call red pilled about what's actually mm-hmm. happening? Uh, all right, all right, hold on. So red pilled. Let's, let's let's do some definition work here. What does it mean to take the red pill, Rod? It comes from the Matrix, uh, mm-hmm. the movie The Matrix, and to take the red pill means to see the world as it really is, okay, and uh, to realize how you have been living, uh, you have been blind 
prior to taking the red pill, you've been duped. Well, I, I think what's happened to a lot of people, and I'm not just making this up, I'm hearing this yep. in my emails and in talking to people when I travel, is that uh, people are starting to wake up and realize, wait a minute, the stuff I've been reading about online for a while or hearing about, about crazy wokeness, people cut, yep. losing their jobs and so forth, that's actually starting to happen to people I know, people in my family. People yeah. have stories. This, I, A woman I met in Virginia, I was up in Northern Virginia over the weekend, um, as I mentioned earlier, given a talk at Patrick Henry mm-hmm. College. Uh, mm-hmm. And I talked at a church there too on Sunday. And a lady came up to me, an older woman, and she said, you know, I was just out recently doing some political canvassing, getting signatures for a petition. Mm-hmm. And I went to this one house and the husband was from Romania. The wife was from Nicaragua. They both came from oh. uh, escaped communist regimes. Yeah, in, dub- in different dub- dub- double, double whammy, right. yeah. And she said, and what, what you told us today, Rod, is what they were telling me when I was talking to them, that they are so concerned about what's happening now because they this is not their first rodeo. Right. And, um, you know, I, I feel like a broken record after a while, but I began to see why you have to talk about this so much because well, so many people, we, we're so conditioned to think about our country and our society in a certain way. Who would have thought that we'd be at a place where the military, a, a guy raised right. his hand in, in the, at this church I was at mm-hmm. and said, you know, I, I served. I can't, yeah. I, I, he said, I'm asking myself, this, the man said to me, I'm asking myself for the first time in my life, is there a real contradiction between being a good American and being mm-hmm. a good Christian? I mean, wow. I mean, you know what? You know what's amazing to me. You know, I, I went. You know, uh, what is amazing to me? You know, thirty years ago, right? Uh, you could not find an American in a mainline church or an evangelical church who would be capable of that sentence, right? No. You might have been able to find a couple of super cranky fringe right wing Catholics who sort of harbored a kind of anti-democrat, the anti-democracy, you know, uh, crown type vision of, of Christendom or something. But I mean, those were pretty fringe characters, yeah. right? And, and, and so, but it, it is remarkable to me that in 2021, that, that you have um, this phenomena, you know, you're, you're sort of becoming this guy, right? I mean, it, it, you've been locked down with COVID, but you have sort of become this guy where everybody kind of comes out of the woodwork and says, Hey, you know, Rod, I got to tell you this story, this yeah. awful thing that I, your inbox must be nuts these days. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And, um, and it's coming from all over, you know, just, just today, uh, one of my readers sent me something, uh, that, uh, Ibram Kendi, Oh, had, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the anti-racist, anti-racism guru. Uh, I mean, he, he was speaking at a, a Manhattan church and he, he said it as clearly as he possibly could. He made the distinction between uh, liberation theology, as he calls it, and savior theology. Yeah. Liberation theology, according to Kendi, is the belief that the role of Christians is to liberate people in this life on this earth from oppressive structures. Right. Savior theology, as he puts it, is the idea that the, you save people who are doing bad things by helping them turn away from those bad things and be healed. Yep. And, and, and Kennedy says, and that kind of theology, savior theology, leads to racism. And bigotry, really? and I thought, which, you know, it's a, it's remarkable. I, I saw yeah. the clip, the same clip today. Which remarkable to me about this, like, you mean like actual theology, like is an actual yeah. Christianity? So, so Christianity is bigotry and it, leads it, it, to whiteness or something. Yeah. How, how 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 does this work, Rod? I mean, well, what if, is the, if you're not if you're not a social justice Christian, as he defines it, then you are a racist, and and what you believe leads to racism. I mean, and again, we roll our eyes. We say, oh, come on. But mm-hmm. this guy, Kendi, is being read at the Pentagon. They're telling these soldiers to, and, the, and the, the, the commanders to read him. He's being read at corporate, uh, in, in corporate boardrooms. He's being read in schools throughout the country and in colleges. This is poison. This is absolute I, poison. And yet, here we are. Yeah, I, I would. I would love, you know, this might mean more in your world and your framework than mine, because I, you know, I have no idea how much like a bestseller is, like how many copies that is or whatever, and and what kind of revenue that would generate for for a writer in a publishing house. But I got to think, you know, just based upon um, what I've been reading and poking around, 
this book, how to be how to be an anti racist, and there are a couple of others, of course, Robin DiAngelo's White Fragility, mm -hmm. and and it set a mark from the beginning. He must be making obscene amounts of money, yeah. but oh, yeah. just by virtue of it just being assigned reading, like everywhere, corporations yeah. are doing it. Every university is doing it. All of these school districts are doing it. And now, like unbelievably, you know, the military. And, and, mm -hmm. I, and so I, I, this sort of gets me to the question, why, why, I mean, why the military? I, I, I'm struggling with this one because it would seem that the military, um, unlike so Unlike so m many other institutions that we have seen um, degenerate into a kind of decadence, I you know the military seemed to be the one that was most um, equipped to withstand this kind of anti excellence um, neo racist uh, mentality. Yeah. I mean, e because even historically, you know, the military certainly doesn't have. Um, a flawless record when it comes to racism and um, and awful things. We we know this, and and that that's an important part of the history of the military and the country to to um, remember. Mm -hmm. But it also has an incredible um, track record, certainly in the last 60, 70 years, of being on the front end of genuine integration and general development yeah. and advancement. And why? Why would it give up these core values of excellence and mission focus? Uh, I, I, I'm just I'm struggling with this. Right. Well, this, this is this is the question. Right. And I put it to so I can't figure it out either. I yeah, mean, it's, it's weird. It, well, I can't figure out why anybody does it. But the military, especially because, as you say, it has it has it's got so much trust in this country by the people of this country. And its job is to win wars. It's the right. The survival of the country depends on the military yeah. being good at this. So I can't figure yeah. it out. And I asked this soldier I talked to mm -hmm. up in mm -hmm. Virginia to explain it. And he said, well, look, Rod, the military is an institution in American life. And every other institution in American life has been conquered by this. Why shouldn't why should the military be exempt? And I guess he's right. I heard a similar thing, Kayla. I know you have two uh, people Talk within the Catholic Church, talking about the corruption in the Catholic Church. Uh, a yeah. priest friend of mine who is absolutely square on this stuff, he knows what's going on and has and calls it out. But he says that the same thing too. He goes, you know, priests aren't aren't hatched in, in a lab. You know, the priests come from yeah. this culture too. And, yeah. you know, we should not be, we should always be surprised and, and appalled when the corruption of the best happens when priests or soldiers right. are, are armed or the police when they are show themselves corrupt we, we rightly hold them to a higher standard mm -hmm. that said the priest <clears throat> is right you know if, if the culture itself is so corrupt then you know we can't expect people uh within the armed services or the priesthood to be completely immune from it well uh, that, that's well put I, I think that's probably right and and you know if i were um if i were motivated Right. And I wanted to fundamentally change the structures and identity of the country. Right. I mean, if I had genuine animus against the United States of America, I had genuine animus against the Constitution. If I had a genuine animus against just the, the, the setup. Right. I think I would absolutely set my sights on the military. Yeah. I would absolutely, you know, we, we know that, you know, we've talked about this, this whole notion of the long march through the institutions. And of course, we know that the, the utter corruption and decadence of our educational institutions from K to 12 and, and in higher ed and, and beyond, we know that that is um, not just a little bit captured. Um, you know, uh, there is no fight. Like it is, mm. it is a route. Um, we know that our um, our cultural um, uh, manufacturing uh, institutions have been corrupted for a very long time. Mm. And so, as I'm saying this stuff out loud, I, I, I'm I'm kind of chiding myself here in real time, um, Kale. Wh how? Why would you allow yourself to be so naive that they wouldn't move then on to the next and the bigger and the greater target, which is well, our military? 
Well, I mean, look, it's and this kind of goes back, or this maybe takes us forward to something mm-hmm. that I, I hope we can talk about. But mm-hmm. uh, I, well, this they, I had some breakfast this morning here in Baton Rouge with some friends from the West Coast, and we were uh, they're making a cross country trip, and yeah. they live out in Southern California, and they were talking about people starting to get red pilled. They didn't use that word, but the stuff we were talking about it. Yeah. And but they said that this year, or this past year, 2020 has been such an eye opener for a lot of people because it's revealing what people really believe and what people really oh. are all about. And um, the reason I, I tie this into what you just said is they're starting to realize, he told me, who in their larger church circles out there is down with being a good middle class American and who is down with the gospel or living out uh, a countercultural life of Christ. Because they told me that they've been seeing people that they thought were completely solid, just flipping overnight on critical race theory to where you can't even talk about it. You know? Okay. Well, why? I mean, what, what do you mean? What well, do you mean that, you know, they're, they're more concerned about being a, a good American? Well, like, why are you because, setting up a, a, an antipathy between being a good American and being a, 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 a genuine Christian? Well, when I say be a good this? American, I'm talking about in, no, in their I'm, case. I'm just being, asking you to explain. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, middle, a middle class conformist, right? Okay. Um, they, uh, these people are, um, that they're talk they were talking about church people middle mm-hmm. class church people in Southern California, um, were more concerned with doing, finding out, you know, what it is, smell in the air, finding out, you know, what it is that mm-hmm. the, that, that respectable middle class people believe and then figure out a way to rationalize that into Christianity. Right. So, uh, and look, I, I can remember. A few years ago, there was a, a push out in California by an LGBT legislator and his allies to take away what's called Cal grants, uh, state education grants that go to individual needy students in the state that they can use at any accredited infor- uh, university or college in the state to pay for their education. Okay. Well, this LGBT legislator uh, wanted to restrict the use of Cal grants to take them away from colleges he thought were bigot colleges, like small Christian colleges wow. that held, you know, to traditional views yep. on homosexuality. Of course. And, so. uh, and he almost won. But I remember talking to a guy from, um, from a big evangelical college who was trying to yeah. muster support. And he went down to Orange County, which is like the hotbed of evangelical, yeah, suburban yeah. evangelicalism. C- certainly it's California, California variety. Right. Yeah. Now, this is like six or seven years ago. He goes mm-hmm. down there, and they said we tried to meet with churches and to get mm-hmm. to get them on side. He said nobody would help us. Yeah, he said yeah. they were all terrified of being called yeah. bigots. He said the only reason we prevailed in that, uh, and it may may just be a temporary thing. The only reason we prevailed was because black Pentecostal pastors in in mm-hmm. South Los Angeles right. and the Hispanic Archbishop of Los An- or Roman Catholic Archbishop of Los Angeles got on board. Otherwise yeah. we would have been sunk. The point yeah. is that these this the sort of thing that that man saw back in that fight that the suburban uh evangelical churches were useless. This is what the my suburban evangelical friends I was having breakfast with today mm-hmm. were telling me that they're seeing. And uh, this one guy said, you know, me and my friends are figuring out that the kind of people that you're going to want to be in in the foxhole with when it all comes down mm-hmm are not necessarily the people that you see at church because the you know there, there could be Christians from other churches mm-hmm. because the the division that's happening now he said is between those who can read the signs of the times and those who either can't or won't and are rationalizing it all away you know when i was um coming up uh when i read myself back into the church in the early 90s and um did my deep dive into theology and all of this sort of thing and you know the the whole rah rah portion of my 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 newfound uh, reclaimed faith in Catholicism. I remember um, encountering something that used to drive me up the wall, which was sort of this talk of ecumenism, right? And you know, Rod, you might have an interesting take on this, uh, given your history in the last fifteen years. Oh. Um, but I remember, and maybe you recall this too, when you were a, a you know a rah rah conservative Catholic back in the day, 
um, in the kind of neocon variety, I guess we would probably say now in retrospect. Um, I remember I would hear the word ecumenism and I would um, I would reach for my gun, uh, proverbially yeah. speaking. Me too. Right? I me mean, too. for me, it was the kind of um, it was the the phrase of a scoundrel looking for some sort of modernist uh, uh, cultural um, uh, conformity, you know, to sort of. You know, um, what's the word? Accommodationist. That's what right, I was right, for. Right, right. right. I used to sort of think of ecumenism as a kind of um, a, a weapon that was wielded by um, more <laughs> what I would have called then sort of liberal Catholics to try to water down the the sure. sort of a full throated gospel. Kumbaya, yeah, 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 right, right. Yeah. And so now um, I have a, a different appreciation of ecumenism, um, in part, of course, because of our friendship, uh, but not just that. You know, I spent a lot of time when I lived out in Los Angeles, I spent a lot of time with um, uh, e the evangelical community, actually. And, and there were a variety, of course, you know, nuances within that community, mm -hmm. um, contrary to what NPR might let you know. And we could talk about NPR in a minute, Rod. Oh, but, uh, let's but, do. But, let's but, but do. hold, but hold, hold, <laughs> hold the phone just for a second. But um, I, it became very evident to me, even out there, that as a as a um, an Orthodox um, uh, Roman Catholic um, who um, you know was serious about things, that there were certain types of evangelicals who were also serious about the gospel, and there were certain kind of evangelicals that were um, not. That they, in retrospect, I think I would call them accommodationists, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and now, uh, in 2021, and I would say, and I'm speaking, um, earnestly and from my own experience here, I guess, um, you know, post Theodore McCarrick and the rot that has been fully exposed, you're right, you know, you've been living with the, the knowledge of this rot for a lot longer than me. Um, but now that I'm sort of fully appreciating the rot of, of my beloved institution and see that rot in all the other places, I'm now having a different appreciation for ecumenism, right? And I will say that, and I'm sure some of my, my very conservative or traditionally minded Catholics are going to bristle at this a little bit, but I am, I'm, I'm in a sort of a crisis of ecclesiology here um, because I, I find myself to be um, finding allies, not necessarily in the person sitting next to me in the pew, although sometimes, but I have allies in Baptist communities. I have allies in Orthodox communities. I have allies in the Jewish communities in ways in which I didn't fully appreciate it because they're, they're not focused primarily on being a normie. They're not focused primarily <laughs> on sort of a bougie accommodationist standpoint in this world. Uh, you know, they they are interested actually in the truth, and it's amazing that there's this sort of new. Um, the, it's almost like I've been looking at a picture for so long, you know, that I thought it was one thing, but all of a sudden there's a slight shift in the light, and I see a fault line mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. I didn't see before, and all right. of a sudden I'm like, oh wait. Like I, I thought I was like on this team and I, you know, I know that's a sort of a, a, an overly simplistic rubric, but I thought I was on this team, but oh my gosh, like they don't yeah. seem like they're on my team. And it sounds no, to me that look, this is what this couple was telling you uh, in bre at breakfast this morning. No, you're, you're completely right. When I was up in, um, in Birmingham, Alabama, a couple of weeks ago, talking to people, I talked to mostly evangelicals, well, not only evangelicals, yeah. and, but it was just so great to be among, what are you shaking there? Uh, my drink. Uh, oh, my cocktail. Blush. Sorry, blush. Yeah, um, I am. Yes, was, that's right. No, it, it was great to, to talk to people who are just, you know, they, they're not going to sit there and argue over fine points of theology with you, though they, they probably could if you asked they them. Could but right? Yeah, of course. Just solid everyday people, husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, who are just wondering what the hell is happening. You know, yeah. am I am, am I crazy? Am I yeah. alone? Right. And my right. role, as it turns out, is to say, you know what? You're not crazy yeah. and you're not alone. I uh, got an email today from a guy, uh, Andrew Beckwith. He's a great guy, great Christian who mm -hmm. uh, lives up in Massachusetts and runs something called the Massachusetts Family Institute, which is, um, you know, really, really. He's right on the front lines in one of the, the, the most uh, overmatched battlegrounds in the country. But Andrew's running a, a, a book club on Live Not By Lies. And um, mm. he said tonight, in fact, as you and I are recording this, uh, he's having the book club. It's underway right now. And he's having some uh, 
young people uh, talk about how they were taught growing up. He's talking mm-hmm. about college students, right? Yeah. About how they were taught growing up to resist the the culture of lies, the cult what John Paul called the culture of death. Yeah. And he said the the thing that is coming out from doing his pre interviews with them is they keep saying that what the Benda family in Prague told me that's in my book really applies to them, which is don't be afraid to be weird. Yeah, you know, I love that. A- I love I, I love that line. I know, and I, I, right? And, and you you've said this before, and I think there was that piece, yeah, whatever, a year and a half ago about weird weird Christians, and yeah. I think it was in the New York Times, right? Um, oh, yeah. I, I don't remember the piece uh, in, in its minute detail, but but I, I I thought that that frame was right. I mean, in all the conversations that I have with my wife and, and about our kids, you know that, and, and you know both of us are pretty. Um, you know, woke in this regard, right? Mm-hmm. You know, we have our eyes pretty wide open about things, but man, that pull, you know, to not be weird is tough. Yeah, you know, it really is. You know, I've got young kids, you know, my, mine are ever so slightly younger than yours, but my oldest is the same age roughly as your youngest. But man, it's really tough. Are well, we going to double down on the weird or not? You well, know? yeah, and here's the, here's the thing. This tells you about the time we're in. You're weird if you find drag queen story hour yeah, to be yeah, yeah. weird. You know, yeah, and, yeah, but look, yeah. but we can sit around, and this is the message I keep trying to bring to, to audiences when I now that I'm going out and talking to them, and it's great yeah. to get this feedback. Yeah, it's yeah. that you've got to be weird if you want to conform to what's yeah. happening now. You are going to lose your faith, and if you don't, your kids will. Um, yeah, weirdness. That's, that, that, it, that's my new. That's my new bumper sticker. You know, it's like be weird. It's important. Yeah, you absolutely, know? it is. And uh, yeah. but I, I I think that this is this is where we are now. This um, this uh, woman I was having breakfast with, this friend mm-hmm. of mine, she said, mm-hmm. you know, all my mommy friends are yeah. reading "Live Not by Lies" because it's the mama bear thing kicking in. It's because yeah. we, we've started to realize, and these people in California, that they really are coming for our kids. They want the minds of our kids. They want their yeah. souls, and we can't let them have it. Um, I, I had this very same conversation with my sister-in-law, you know, some you know months back. We were talking about you know whatever stuff going on with colleges and everything, and and I just remember telling her, I was like, "Look, man, you know, they." And I'm sorry if I sound like a crazy person, but it's true. I've seen it up close and personal with my own students and everything. They, as in the colleges, they, as in the sort of the the powers that be in 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 this cultural production uh, insanity they are hungry for your children they want them and they are mm-hmm. not going to stop and and i think that part of this sort of anti normy bit that you and i are on right now the sort of anti uh, you know you know be uh, pro weird anti normy bit is that look you know they're not nice they're not going to be nice about this, right? So your your winsomeness, you know, while it might win you some points on Twitter, uh, it might win you some points in 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 whatever circles you 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 circulate in that are not real. Um, in in the real world, you know, mm-hmm. when you send your kids off to wherever it is you're you know you're sending your kids, they're hungry for your kids, and and they start right away. Day one, hour one, minute one, you know, when it comes to, you know, they're going to, they're going to, they're coming for your kids. And I know I, you know, maybe I sound like I'm on a rant right now and no. I'm, a, I'm, I'm, well, crazy you about are, it, but you I are, see but, it. but, but, no, but I see, see it. I see it with my students. I see it. Yeah. But, but I mean, it, this is not something that you're just getting off of Facebook. You see it. Right. I mean, you, you and I've had these conversations before about what, what the, these kids come to come to your school and how, yeah. what culture has done to them. Right. Yeah. And uh, I, I think, you look just this past week what we've been through. We had those horrible shootings okay. in um, in Atlanta, the the massacre at the at the massage parlors, and it emerged fairly soon that this the the killer, uh, the con- now confessed killer, uh, yeah. was this Southern Baptist guy, white male, who was just tormented by unwanted sexual desire, was addicted yep. to pornography, yep. had spent six months in a rehab center to try to get over his sexual desire, and. He right. finally snapped. His parents had just kicked him out of the house because they caught him using porn right. again. And right. uh, he went out to you know, externalize his self-hatred. And to he went to massage parlors where he had, had mm-hmm. gone in search of sex before because some, a lot of these Asian massage parlors are really more or less prostitution fronts. I mean, it's a, yeah, well, it's a fronts for trafficking, right? Right, I mean, human trafficking. It's, yeah. a, it's a terrible thing, yeah. but they're run by mafioso who traffic yeah. Asian women here. 
And right, so right. he went there and he shot uh, six of the eight people he killed were Asian. Well, our media, I mean, it's a horrible story and it's worth talking oh, about what, what yeah. this thing, what this brings up about human trafficking, about pornography mm-hmm. and all that. Wait, but but I, I don't remember hearing anything about pornography or trafficking. What, what, what did we hear well, about? Right? Yeah, what we heard about was uh, anti, this is an anti-Asian hate crime. You know, uh, the, it's, and, whiteness. And it's whitness, it's whiteness, it's white right? supremacy. It's whiteness. Yeah. We heard about how, um, you know, they even went after the Southern Baptists. This guy went to a Southern Baptist church. There are 8 million Southern Baptist men in this country. 16 million Southern Baptists, 8 million other men. How often does this happen? Yeah, right? But no, they, they're just looking for anything. And um, it's just today. Uh, it's a week after it happened. I was in a drive through at lunch. Mm-hmm. And I hear NPR, they do a story on here and now uh, wait, in which wait, wait, they wait, talk wait, about you, how you, 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 you did NPR in the car. Well, yeah. I mean, do, do you have to make a do you have to make a confession about doing the NPR? You know what? In the you car? know what? I have to I, I, I would read Probed if I were a criminologist. <laughs> but, so so and they were doing this story Sorry. about how, yeah, the Atlanta police say there's no evidence that this was a hate crime, but they brought an expert on to say, well. Did the Atlanta police even know what they're looking at? And we know this is a hate crime. I mean, the narrative is relentless. And um, just imagine a kid growing up in all this. And that's all he hears. Yeah. That's all he hears. Or they they become so angry at the narrative that they only listen to people who lie from the other side. At this this conference I was at at the the college in Northern Virginia, Patrick Henry Mm -hmm. College, there was a really uh, good professor, uh, Joshua Mitchell from Georgetown. He has a new book out about identity politics. And he told the, uh, the audience, mostly students, that the thing that worries him the most is what happens when you have a milit- a milit- not militarized, a militant mm-hmm. right wing reactionary resistance that doesn't care about Christianity, that doesn't right. care about not being racist. It says, Call us what you want. We're, we don't care, and and this is what these 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 narrative uh, fanatics are producing in this country. This well, the, the guy. Yeah. I, 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 one more thing, and I'll stop. I'll get off my yeah, no, 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 no. Please, no, no, the no, guy. The guy who wrote to me that we were talking about a few minutes ago, the yeah. the, the Jag, who's now been kicked out. <clears throat> what do you think is going to happen, Kale? When if the military going through this purge now of, of yeah. all the right wing so called extremists, mm-hmm. if if they're even calling a guy who made a silly joke uh, about the army of the Northern Virginia, if he's an extremist who loses his career, what's going to happen when they purge all these people? Where are they going to go? These are guys who are gonna they're not going to be winsome. Rob, no, they, they're not going to be winsome about this. Angry ex military guys who are armed and who see the institution they love being taken over by values that are uh, inimical to what they have always believed America stood for. And you know what? They'll be right about that. But, um, you know, th- but it doesn't seem to occur to these wokesters that there's going to be a horrible backlash. Well, uh, Rod, in a different context, this would mean something uh, entirely different. You made me spill like uh, Sorry. sorry with, but, your, with your uh, sweet, che- uh, cheerful talk, you make I, uh, I stay no, in my mouth. No, but... But but in in a in a different register, right? We would say here uh, that error has no right, hmm. wouldn't we? <laughs> right. So this is some sort of strange, like nihilistic, uh, atheistic. Uh, uh, what is that movement called again? That I always make fun of. This. Sorry. Um, no, this is some sort of strange atheistic um, uh, woke. Um, integralism i mean yeah. it really is it's 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 it's, yeah. it's hard for me to say that even with a straight face because i'm sure that lots of people would be very angry with me right now well um, yeah. but, but, but it, it is right it it's it, it's it's insatiable yeah it really is and it won't it won't stop anywhere just before we came on tonight to talk about this i i read an, a, an op-ed in usa today talking about Oral roberts university is a cinderella story and the march madness Oh yeah, you know, the basketball. Go- yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, basketball team. Or Roberts team is really go- keep they keep beating the big teams. This op-ed said, yeah, they're a Cinderella story, but not really because if you look at them, 
They come from this fundamentalist Christian school, sure. and they oppress LGBT folks there. Yeah, those are the bad guys. Those are the bad There's guys. The bad no guys. complexity. Like, bad yeah, guys, yeah, and so this, this op-ed is telling you, don't root for them. I mean, this is punching down, absolutely. <sighs> don't root for them because they they have uh, retrograde opinions about LGBTs. And, you know, this is just, by now, it's just uh, every day there's something else. But this is about... Um, about marginalizing and demonizing Christians. That's all this is. Well, yeah, you know, it's interesting too. You know, we're recording this show um, uh, a few hours after the, um, a little bit more of the identity of the man who um, murdered, well, I think eight people. Ten people. In Col- ten people, sorry, in, in Colorado. And uh, it was really fascinating to watch Twitter in real time, right? Because when it initially hit, was it yesterday, Rod? I, I'm sorry, these yeah, things sort of was mashed together. Morning. It was yesterday morning. Um, uh, the fact that the gunman was apprehended and not killed was immediately um, evidence on Twitter that the gunman, the murderer, uh was 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 a white supremacist. He had to be a white guy because they would have killed him still, otherwise. He, right, he was still alive. Right. Okay. I mean, that's a very familiar. You know, if you follow any any of the folks on Twitter who do these kinds of things, you you know that this was coming. I mean, this was his. This was his. You could set your watch to it. Right. So then, of course, it comes out that the man is uh, a devout. Uh, Muslim, he's from Syria, and he has a history of mental illness. Mm-hmm. And so then you saw the woke Twitterati saying, "Right, well, you know, uh, the Syria, you know, the Syrians are white adjacent, and and they're, you know, they're they're really white, right? That this is yeah. that this is a part of the the <sighs> pandemic of whiteness, which reminds me again of these awful." Awful pieces. I think you even uh, uh, blogged about one earlier this week from the Root. Was that was that the? Piece? Oh yeah, yeah. Damon uh, Young from the uh, this black. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, black. fascinating. I mean, what is this? I mean, it's 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 clear racism. Clear yeah, racism. The guy in the Root, Damon Young, a popular black commentator on this black site, was saying that um, you know that whiteness kills and. And this was his riff on what happened in, in Atlanta. Whiteness kills. Whiteness killed my mother. His mother died of lung cancer, but it's whiteness fault. Uh, on and on and on. But, but the language he uses, Kale, it reminded me, I, and I'm not just making this making a leap here. It reminded yeah. me of language I first encountered at uh, Yad Vashem in Jerusalem. That's Israel's what is, Holocaust what is that? Memorial, Yad Vashem. Okay. And when I, I visited Jerusalem in the year 2000, I was there on a reporting trip. Uh, I had mm-hmm. some extra time, so I went out to Yad Vashem to visit it and pay my respects. Mm-hmm. And they were having a, a had a, a an exhibition there at the time mm-hmm. of how the German people were prepared by the use of language in the public square for the Holocaust. And they started back in like the late 19th, early 20th century with the eugenicists and the German doctors praising eugenics. Right. And they started out talking about how helping people to conceive of the German nation as a body. And there was a big health fad in the turn of the century. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of nudism, weird stuff going on in Germany. Yeah. But anyway, the people were really fanatical about health. Well, then they started talking about Jews. Well, as, when, all you, when all you've got is this world, you know, you can quickly <laughs> divert to this kind. No, I mean, I'm serious. I mean, yeah. I think it, it can qu- quickly divert to these kind of like health and wellness things. That might well, then they started talking audience. about so Jews. Great, as, we go. Anyway, Jews as parasites, you know. Right, right. And, and they start talking about uh, foreign invaders to the body politic, making the body unhealthy. Uh, and then they start talking about Jews as being those people and parasites. Right. And eventually, vermin, by the time vermin, the Nazis, par- yep, yep, yep. By the time the Nazis came along, people were ready, you know. Yeah. Similarly, in um, in Rwanda, when they had the the Rwanda massacres, uh, the radio, right. Radio yeah. Mil Colin, um talked about, you know, propagandized about how the Tutsis were were parasites and it was, it's all about dehumanization. Yeah. Anyway, I bring this all up because this guy, Damon Young, writing on the root, is using classic language of dehumanization right. of its people. And he talked about it at the very end. He says white supremacy and whiteness is a virus that won't go away until there are no bodies left for it to inhabit. And they're like, Whoa. And of course you're like, you're like, full stop, take a deep breath. 
did you just hear that, people? I mean, right? I mean, that 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 when I when I, you know, I actually, I, I remember when when I, when I heard it, I was like, wait a second, he didn't just say that, like that, like that's that's no, nope. oh yes, he, he actually, did. He he actually said that, right? And yeah. and it, wow, I mean, that is, and yet of course the the the, the double irony of, is that. That, that, that he's coming from the standpoint that he's the social, you know, he's bringing about social justice, right? right? right. He's bringing about, you know, uh, he's eminentizing the Christian eschaton in the here and the now, right? And it's like, well, no, actually, he's bringing hell. Yeah. And, like that, and remember, this is hell. Yeah. Remember the lesson from, uh, right about this and Live Not By Lies yeah. about the Red Terror. The communists instructed their agents. Sorry, to, right. Good, good. Yeah, yeah. Don't pay attention to what people right. actually did or said. Right, 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 right. Just look and see what social class they come from. That's That'll right. tell you who to kill. That is the That's essence, right. they said, of the Red Terror. This wasn't even hypocrisy. They were openly doing that. This is what the the woke are doing now. And you know, I'm not saying that it's going to lead to shooting people. I mean, let's hope it doesn't. But I hope it doesn't. Where yeah. is this dehumanization gonna stop? The, yeah. One of the, the great things about the Christian tradition and how the civil rights generation, Dr. King and, and his cohorts did with it, is they helped white America learn to see black Americans as humans, human beings. It's made in the image of God. And they, they helped tear the scales off the eyes of Americans who didn't want, white Americans who didn't want to see it or who were maybe too inert and not to, to see it. Well, Look, now in just, what, 50, 60 years, we're, we're going to a place now where the most progressive opinions mm-hmm. are the most retrograde and violent and, and racist. Columbia University having this year uh, uh, apartheid graduations. Are you going to have a graduation for uh, Latinx people, for black right. people? And all? I mean, it's like this, it, it, this is the topsy-turvy world that we're in now where the sort of thing that you and I of our generation were taught and taught rightly was right. immoral is now the the cutting edge of progressive compassionate well you know i, I you know some some of the, one of my favorite uh twitter followers is you know bridget fetacy and she sort of jokes and i think she's right every day you know is that 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 you know the simulation is breaking down right i mean like that we live in an episode of south park right i yep. mean it, it's sort of becoming a truism that when south park makes fun of something in 2 years we're going to be living, living in that it. bizarro reality which is again hell it's it's hell like this yeah. is this is not a good place that we're going I, I, the last thing that i want to do before we we, we tack i want to talk a little bit about live not by lies but i'm i am saddened by the lack of you know those people uh, those folks right who work the media and work in in education they work in these sort of um these cultural production uh, mechanisms i'm i'm genuinely saddened rod by their um they seem to lack a kind of imagination that is broad enough to encompass complexity beyond the, the sort of the simple world that that a Kendi creates mm-hmm. for us. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's really <clears throat> staggering. And, and look, Rod, you've been moving in these circles for a long time. You've been a, in the media for a very long time. You know that there are genuinely intelligent and sensitive and and broad-minded folks, where are they with all of this? Like I, I'm I'm again I'm the outsider. Like I I I toil in obscurity up here and in a little school, and you know I just do my thing. But I'm just shocked at the lack of imagination. But they're scared. They're scared. I don't. Some of them are scared of being punished uh, for it. Scared mm. of being cast out of of, of the elect. Uh, others are genuinely scared of being on the quote-unquote wrong side of history yeah it does a lot um, of work that phrase doesn't it yeah it does I mean, th- yeah they're, i this is my theory they're mm-hmm. they're they're afraid to be weird they really mm-hmm. are That's and afraid to be weird and afraid to be bad and the, i i think that when the time when the history of this era is written there's there's going to be a lot to be said a lot of negative things to be said about the complete abdication of responsibility by those who are given charge of 
running the institutions of our society. And, and, and the conformity is shocking. Yeah. I mean, I, I grew up in the 90s, you know, right in the 80s and the 90s. And the number one thing that people and, you know, the very smart people would make fun of was the was the uh, conformity of the awful 50s, right? I mean, that was like a, that was just a thing that was mm -hmm. said all the time, right? You know, that Thank God the '60s came and rid rid us of the 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 oppressive conformity of the '50s era. And look, fair enough. I didn't live through that. Maybe it was, but what is shocking to me is we live in a new era of conformity, and it's a it's a, it's a it has the, the 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 clothing and the dressing and the affect of of progressivism and broad, you know, and 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 mm -hmm. weirdness. But it's the most normal, most conservative kind of culturally hegemonic uh world uh that that would make the 50s kind of jealous for its ability to 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 marshal conformity i mean it, it's really remarkable you know what you're saying that it makes me look forward to going to france in a couple of weeks i'll be going uh, over there to promote the french edition of oh. uh, live not by lies but poor Rod has to make a trip to Paris. I mean, I know how much that pains you, Rod. I mean, you know, Paris. Ooh, who likes Paris? Nobody you know. likes Paris. But, <laughs> but um, what's interesting about it is uh, Emmanuel Macron, the French president, mm -hmm. gave a speech or something recently in which he said, we have to resist this virus uh, of this crazy ideology of wokeness coming from America. Who would have thought the wow. French, the, 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 the May 1968... Our right. nation right. is now saying that, hey, I'm, this stuff's coming from America. We've got to stop it. But they're completely right to do it. Yeah. Uh, I, it's going to be interesting to see how my book does among the French, uh, because, you know, they, as I said, as Macron said there, it's really starting to hit them in a big way. And I really want to see how what kind of reaction it gets. Is this going to sound like to the French journalist I talked to? Like, yeah. does some explain this to this to us? What, what, why, why this matters to us? Or will they say like, yeah, that's we're dealing with it too? Well, you know, I mean, Rod, you know, you've you've written a number of books, and 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 live not by lies has really been sort of consistently in the news, and in fact, in the last couple of days, you know, you. you I'm, I'm look, I'm happy. Obviously, I, I, I've known you and we've been sort of talking about it before it was even a, a, a completed thing, um, you know, but you you latched on to the implications of what this emergent, then emerging, now emergent woke ideology was going to bring about. Um, do you think as Maybe this is a good okay. I think this is a good question. I I don't want to stump you here. It's not the point of it. I'm just really trying to get you to sort of mm -hmm. talk out loud about it. But you know, we're we're hopefully right. I mean, you know, you got your shot the other day, and it looks like the 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 the, the, the vaccine is being rolled out. Uh, certainly in this country, um, it's really d doing a good job uh, getting out there. Um, do you think as the world sort of emerges, hopefully out of this COVID thing, you know, the thing? Um, what do you think is uh, what do you think live not by lies is going to look like when we when we sort of can go outside and hang out with the people again? Uh, I don't know. You say that live not by lies has been in the news. And in fact, it hasn't been in the news at all. But it's been almost. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, but but this is an important point. I mean, it's been yeah, an almost sorry, complete I, I, news yeah. blackout of it on it. But yet it is selling so well. I mean, we just hit 100,000 copies. And uh, it's there's no sign of it slowing down. Pe more and more people are discovering it, but it's a word of mouth thing. You know, people are passing it on to their to their friends and and to their family. People send me emails all the time saying, "I bought a copy for all of my my kids." And mm -hmm. I, I think that the, what, what's going to happen when we can all come out again, everything will have been sorted. One of the things that I, I'm hearing now from people is. The, and I heard it this morning in our conversation. I heard it a lot uh, in Birmingham and also in Virginia. Is that people are aware now that they don't have yeah. to uh, work in the office. They can get their work done from elsewhere. And in turn, they don't have to live where they're living. Uh, so um, I'm hearing from people yeah. saying now that they're thinking of moving, like getting out of blue America, moving to red America, which I, that makes sense to me at, at a certain level because – it, I mean, if you're living in California or Massachusetts, the state is so everything is stacked against you. The culture, the the state yeah. government, you're better off in Alabama or Louisiana or a place like that. But mm -hmm. please don't think that you can escape this. Wherever the internet is, 
there is the thing. And uh, when I, it was so shocking to me in Alabama, I, I heard about a man who um, whose wife is demanding that they use special pronouns in the house. And he's like, are you not? It's Alabama. I'm, Alabama. It's yeah. Alabama. Yeah. Uh, but I'm just yeah. saying that, you know, this is this no, is something that the middle class, especially the aspiring the, the middle class, those who aspire to status. This is the new ideology. This is the successor ideology. And you're not going to escape it fully in Louisiana or Alabama, but it, you'll find more people, I think, willing to take a stand. I could be wrong about that. One of the things, yeah, why, I, I, I wonder about this too. And I, I think you're right. I mean, I, one of the things, you know, you and I, uh, you know, we're from Louisiana, right? But, you know, every college town, right? I mean, you know, has a, a thri- typically thriving alternate you know, universe. Right. But the funny thing is that that alternate universe as experienced in a town in Louisiana or Alabama um, is the dominant universe in our, in our, in our, in our, in our blue cities. Right. Uh Um, But, but, you know, just because your child goes to school, you know, in a, in a, in a deep red state, uh, guess what? It doesn't matter. No. It doesn't matter. And, and, you know, and, and some people say, oh, you know, you need to get your kid out of a public school and send him to a private school. Well, guess what? <laughs> that that's that that's th- th- there's no home base. Oh, no. Right. There's, and, th- and, th- there, there's no firewall. As you know, in, uh, in Baton Rouge, where I live and where you grew up, Episcopal High School mm-hmm. is considered one of the most elite high school. And they've been woke for a while, you know, yeah. Yeah. and um well, it's, look, I mean, I've been I've been going to these to these, you know, educational conferences for years. Right. The, you know, the, the you know, the National Association of Independent Schools. And, you know, they they have been captured for a very long time. You know, there was a time, you know, maybe 10, 12 years ago, which you would go to the national conferences and you would go and hear talks from like Jim Collins, you know, the writer of from from good to great. And right, you know, you'd right. go to hear some educational guru about, uh, you know, organizational stuff and being mission focused and all that sort of stuff. And then about 10 years ago, you know, that, that, you know, the, the, the mission creep, right. The woke creep started coming in. And of course I've been sensitive to this for a long time, just because I've read history. And you're I, a sensitive I'm a stu- guy. Uh, by nature. Yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm, su- I'm super sensitive. Right. No, but I mean, I, I was sensitive to these kinds of things because I had gone to graduate school. Mm-hmm. Right. And I knew, I knew my Derrida and my Lacan and my Foucault and, and all of that stuff. Right. I knew where this was coming from. And, and I knew that at, at about that time, all those people that I'd gone to graduate school were now in positions of, 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 authority and 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 uh and power at the various schools that they went on to teach at and so i mean i've always sort of known that this was coming but those those big national conferences are now i mean you know you should you know we should do a show just on looking at what is on offer at the national well, association of independent schools this time around i mean it's, it's all woke all the time and 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 it's and it's not going to abate no, and like right. you saw what happened at Villanova. I'll, I put this ah, up. Reverend Donahue, Reverend Donahue. Good Lord, yeah. The uh, uh, somebody at Villanova sent me this statement out, put out by Father Peter Donahue, the president of Villanova, after the shooting in 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 uh, Atlanta, Atlanta. You know, yeah. talking about oh, our hearts are breaking. We we're, we stand by our Asian students and all that. But this was part of um of a in a letter talking about how we are committing to make this uh, Villanova an anti-racist school, you know, which, uh, you know, as we know, the Soup jargon to nuts. means Soup something. To nuts. Yeah, mean, yeah, we mean something. And he tacked on to that uh, an implicit denunciation of the Vatican for refusing to uh, to uh, bless same-sex uh, unions. Right. And he right. said that our LGBTQIA, whatever uh, community, will always be welcome and safe here as if any of them had to worry about being gay bashed right. because right. the Pope and Villanova. Yeah, I mean, come yeah, on. Yeah. But it's all yeah. virtue signaling. And uh, but but look, can I just say this? Can I can I say what I, I'm I gonna go? let it happen. Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna let it happen. Yeah, no, go I, ahead. No, because <laughs> we I, I realize we've been griping for an hour here, but before hey, we it's go, what we do, man. It's what we before do. Before we go, it is before we go, what I want to say is I can't tell you how encouraged I have been. By going out these these little trips I've made, Alabama and Virginia, and 
seeing people face to face and seeing people who are waking up to what's going on and who want to do something about it and do something more than just rearrange their opinions or own the libs. And, and yeah, even yeah. at Patrick Henry College, I am um, a very conservative school. A lot of homeschoolers go there. Um, mm. The young people I talk to, and I look, I, I didn't talk to all of them, but the ones yeah, I yeah, talked yeah. to were really impressive. And they didn't seem like the kind of careerist kids who just wanted to get to Capitol Hill and move right up, you know, the Republican industrial complex. They seem like kids who are serious about their faith, wanted to understand the world and wanted to do something different. And uh, I talked to this one young man who said, you know, just owning the libs is fun, but that's not going to change anything. Right. And uh, I I find that so encouraging. I um, these people I met in Birmingham, these guys that. Uh, I heard from Matt Burford today. He was my host up there. He's oh, a yeah. Southern, yeah, Southern yeah, Baptist yeah. pastor. Great guy. Matt said, Rod, you can't believe how energizing your visit here was because you've got us all talking now. It's guys. We yeah. want to. And Matt's put together this festival he wants to do where just um, serious Christian men get engaged and come together just to be together and talk about our world. He wants to get Aaron Wren down there for the mass. We got, we got to do that, man. We got, we yeah. got to descend upon. I got to, yeah, yeah. I got to do that. Podcasts from there. He, yeah, he's yeah. going to get uh, um, uh, Carl Truman and uh, yeah, some okay. of these guys in and who, who see what's going on and can not tell us, tamp it down and be winsome and pretend, you know, pretend like it's not happening. And who also don't want to stoke the sort of, you know, rage monkey behavior that yeah. is no good either. And uh, the fact that I, I get to be part of this, that this, this awakening that's going on, um, it's just great. And people, you, you, your, your girlfriend, Barry Weiss, uh, oh, I love Barry. I love Barry. Yeah. You know, she's sending stuff out, uh, too. And, it's exciting to make these new yeah. friends across. Yeah. You, you talked about ecumenism. We start out talking yeah. about that. That's right. I love telling audiences when I speak to church audiences, I say it's time to make these uh, make these alliances reach across the lines because in the in the gulag, they weren't put in there for being Catholic or Orthodox or Protestant. Right. They're put in there right. for being Christian. Christian. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, and I, my my favorite thing, you know, you you mentioned it briefly in the last podcast, but 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 to me, the most moving part of the story that you said about your trip to Birmingham, I think it was, is that you know at the end of one of the gatherings, you'd given a talk that you had, you know, Catholics and Orthodox and Protestants, and you all got together and you said this this Our Father. We said together. the Our Father. And, and I, I love that. I mean, that that's just such a powerful. You know, that's where we are. You know, I just did a a length another lengthy conversation with Pastor. Paul Vanderclay. He's part of the Christian Reformed Church. He's a pastor out in Sacramento, California. And, and we've been talking a lot about this, that there's the old um, dispensations, the old confessions, like they seem to be um, kind of of a different time and a different era and, and, and ill-suited, I think, to what we're facing. And mm-hmm. one of the reasons why I love doing this podcast with you, Rod, is that you you give uh, so many people, um, I know people, you know, I know you think you're sort of being doom and gloom all the time, but I I don't think that that's accurate. I think that you are sort of soberly um, telling the truth and people are responding to it. I think that that's what you're finding. I mean, your trip to, you know, I know this because I respond to the things you write and we, the things that we talk about all the time, right? Mm -hmm. But you go off to Virginia, you go off to Birmingham finally after the COVID lockdowns. And and I think you're starting to see the, the, the real effect of this sort of work that, you know, you, you know, you roll out of bed and you roll into your little office there at the house and you sort of type away. And, <laughs> yeah. I, and I'm sure you're just like, I guess I'm just doing stuff. I mean, yeah. you know, the American conservative likes that I do it because I get a paycheck and like, this is great. But I don't think that uh, you fully appreciate how much of an impact this sort of stuff has on people. And, you know, look, that's that's part of what we're doing. Well, you know, you're very kind to say that. I appreciate no, it. I, I know you're it. being I honest. It. And I, no, I mean, it. Know, yeah, and I, I um, you know, it's sound, I, I can't believe I've turned at the ripe age of 54 into the kind of person who can say this unironically, but um, glory to God. Thank Because yeah. any good yeah. thing I do is Christ working in me. And yeah. um, it's, I, I could remember, even, I'm a Gen Xer, right? I'm so ironic. Yeah. I, 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 I know, I, I know. Roll you... my eyes at somebody yeah. saying that, but I'm, I'm old enough now and I've been through enough stuff to, to realize how flawed I am. And how much mercy God has shown me uh, in leading me to repentance. And there's a lot of repenting left mm-hmm. to be done. But uh, what a, 
what an adventure to live yeah. as a Christian, as an Orthodox, big O and small O Orthodox Christian. I I want to just tell people when I when I meet them, you know, a lot of people write to me privately, want to know about Christianity. You know, this it, it, it is so. If I say fun, that's the wrong word. It's, yeah. it, it can't be fun, but it is. I, I have a sense, Kale, of what the what they told me. This guy Victor Popkov in Moscow told me when I interviewed him. He had. Yeah. gone to prison for his faith, but he came to Christ in the early 1970s as part of a, of a revival there. He had not been raised to anything. He said that he was just completely... Well, no, he had been raised a Bolshevik. Let's, let's be no, clear. No, no, that was Ogorodnikov. Ogorod- okay, sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry. Popkov sorry. is somebody different, but he was part right, of Ogorodnikov's sorry. group. He was not um, raised anything in uh, Popkov, and he said that, you know, he said there has to be more to life. I think he had yeah. read Camus, and he said, I can't... There's got to be more than than this Soviet, this dead Soviet life we've got. And he discovered the Christians. He discovered Ogorodnikov and this small group of Christians who, by their courage, by their willingness to say, to be weird, and not just weird, dangerously yeah. weird for right. the Soviets, um, they had life. And Popkov came and joined them. And I think it was Popkov who told me, quoted in the book, is like, we knew that even though the KGB was watching us and all that, that mm-hmm. just to be there singing hymns together and praying together and having that fellowship, that was real freedom. That was real joy. I'll never forget that. Well, we're starting to build that now here. Um, We don't have that kind of persecution. It may come, but uh, man, just to be with other people who see, who can affirm to you that you're not crazy and you're not alone. What a gift that is. And this is something that my faith and my work is, is bringing me towards, and I just want to tell everybody else about it. Like, come, come, join us. No, I think that's right. You know, and and I, I, I have long believed this, and and sometimes even felt that 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 this this strange Christian calling that all of us have, right, is is ultimately a call to heroism. And and you know, you might not think of yourself as a hero. You know, you might not think of yourself as sort of you know the knight in shining armor. But we're all called to this 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 heroism, and and. And ultimately, heroism means you know standing up for what's right and what's true, right? And 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 to protect the innocent and and to speak against falsehood. And and I'm I'm so heartened, honestly, just by the work that we've been doing and and the kind of feedback that we've been getting. I'm just so heartened by like people are really hungry and thirsty for this. And yeah. and it's meant so much to me that you know, like I said, I feel like I've you know I've been sort of doing my my little job here and teaching my classes, and I've enjoyed that so much. But just to to, to, to meet people online that, that are really hungry for it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, it, it helps me, you know, there's a great line in, um, in Shadowlands, uh, with, uh, it's a, the movie about C.S. Lewis and, 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 uh, in the, the play that it's based off the line is, you know, we read so, as, so that we know that we're not alone. And, and so I, to, to riff on that a little bit, I mean, I, I think that, you know, Rod, you write, uh, in such a way that that leads people to understand that they're not alone, and and hopefully you know we talk and we produce this podcast you know so that so that folks know that they're not alone, and and that's just that's great stuff. I mean that's um, yeah. I feel like you know gosh I, I I'm a Gen Xer too, and so I'm sort of uncomfortable with this lack know, of irony that I'm that that, that I'm I'm, yeah. I'm I'm throwing out right now, but I, I really sincerely mean it. And um, you know look uh, before we do the the the, the Uncle Bubba send off here, I just want. Everyone in the audience, you know, please pray for me and pray for Rod. Um, you know, we we do this work, and sometimes it's it's weird and strange. And please pray that we have uh, that all of us here and the people who listen to the show and watch the show that we have the courage of our convictions, and ultimately we have the courage to be weird because I do think that this time, <laughs> no, I mean, I yeah, think no, this time right. in, in twenty twenty one is like, man, we're called to be weird right now, and uh, don't be afraid to do it. So. Yeah, um- on that note, Rod, oh, on, on that, what, what else? Well, I don't listen, what, what is your send off today besides Bubba? Well, no, but before we get to Cap, what Captain yeah. Bubba has to say, I want to yeah. mention that you and I have talked. Our, our listeners might be excited to know that uh, now that we've gotten into the rhythm of this, we're going to start inviting guests on. And yep. Uh, yep. one of the, the first guests I want to bring on is Carl Truman. You read uh, his book. Yes. His recent I am, book. I am, I am, I am knee deep in the middle of it. I oh, love this well, you book, Carl Truman. I, here it yeah, is. There it is. It, 
the rise and, and triumph of the modern self uh, people, uh, this is like the source code of what we're going through right now. I oh, cannot yeah. wait to talk to Carl about yeah. this book. I mean, it really is good. It, it's, it's, a, it's a serious book. This is not what I would consider a beach read. No. Uh, but man, Rod, I'd love to maybe even do a, a, a you know, a, a segment on a show just about the book and then invite Carl on. I think it would be fantastic. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, th this book yeah. is the one to read now to understand where we are. Um, it, it's Truman's such a good writer too. It, it's a, uh, it is, it, it's, it's really, that's exactly right. It's not just the content's not, it, it's not just good content, but man, he's a good writer. No, it, you it's know? weird because the topic is so, topics are heavy, but it doesn't yeah, read yeah, like yeah. a heavy book. It's like yeah. this man is it, you're, I know you're having the same experience. I did. It's yeah. just like, he's opening my eyes and helping me yeah. understand things yeah. that I have felt, but I've not so been able grow, to. I know I've been. Yeah, I've been groping at these insights. I've been like, why is that thing? Why that doesn't make sense? What's going on? And then obviously, like, oh, you know, it, yeah, exactly. there it is, right? Yeah. It's great. Yeah, so yeah. anyway, uh, so uh, listeners, viewers, understand yeah. that we're going to start bringing these people on and, and talking to them because we see our job, and it's not just a job, it's fun to fun. engage yeah, with this, these yeah. people who are uh, smart and good-hearted and brave and who have messages that we all need to hear. So until that time... Don't get nothing on you. All right, Rod. You take care, man. Bye. Right, thanks. Bye.